A bar chart is a set of rectangles placed on an X and Y axis, each length proportional to the values it represents. When those rectangles turn 90 degrees to go from the ground up, we have a column chart. When some bars or columns are from the same category, we place them together in a group bar or column chart, which people also call a clustered bar or column chart. When these bars or columns are stacked on top of each other also to represent a total value, we have a stacked bar or column chart. When a bar or column chart is placed against some benchmark ranges, we have a bullet chart. The range is represented by an outer stacked bar or column, with the actual subject data represented by the inner bar or column, creating a bullet shape. When one or more values are very large compared to others, the bar or column chart just looks bad. People fix it by bending the axis into a circle, and we have the radial bar or circular bar chart. When a radial bar only has one value, it's a circular gauge. When people want to take advantage of the left side of a bar chart, we have the diverging chart. If the diverging chart has stacked bars, we add the word stacked to the name. One famous application of the diverging chart is the population pyramid, or the age-sex structure diagram. It's so popular that people consider it a graph type of its own. When the data designer has kids, he may turn the bar or column chart into a pictogram, where each data point is represented by a small square, image, or a sticker. If we just use sizes instead of the number of squares to represent values, we have the icon chart. When a data designer gets creative, those rectangles can turn into different shapes, say, lollipop. We have a lollipop chart. When a lollipop has more than one candy, we have a dot plot. When a dot plot only has two candies, it becomes something more masculine, the dumbbell chart. When a dumbbell chart want to be more inclusive of various body types, it can show itself as a range plot. When a range has a middle value, the range plot becomes the box chart. This chart is usually used to depict the distribution of one or more groups of numeric data. An alternative solution to the box chart is the violin plot, where each set of boxes and whiskers is replaced with a density curve built around a central baseline. Go back to the box chart, one huge application used in the financial industry for addictive things, like Bitcoin prices, is the candlestick chart. The outer range now represents the min and max values in a time period. The middle range can be used to represent other values. One variation of the candlestick is the OHLC chart, where they add two marks on the left and right to represent the open and the closing prices, respectively. When a bar or column starts where the previous one left off, we have the waterfall chart. This chart helps understand the cumulative effect of changes, both positive and negative. Another popular variation of the range plot is the Gantt chart. It's basically the range plot, but used to show activities or tasks performed against time. When a bar or column chart depicts the frequency of a variable, it is called a histogram or frequency distribution graph. Say you have a history so long that your histogram cannot fit into a page. One solution is to bend the x-axis into a spiral. This is called the spiral chart. When a histogram is placed on a circle and all bars or columns start from a center point instead of the axes, we have the radial histogram. That's it for the bar and column family. When a data set has a continuity characteristic, for example, a value over time, a line may be used instead of multiple bars or columns. We have the line chart, and here comes its whole new family of variants. When a line chart is used together with a traditional bar or column chart, we have a Pareto chart. If people need a separate and independent axis to represent the line in a Pareto chart, we have the dual axis chart. To demonstrate a mathematical equation, a series of points whose coordinates satisfy the equation form a line. This is the function plot. When a line chart has only two values, it creates a unique slope for each line. People call it the slope chart. When a slope chart has a few more slopes, but not too many, we have a parallel coordinates. When a parallel coordinates is used to show rankings over time, it's called a bump chart. When a line chart needs to be more curvy, a smooth curve connects all the data point dots, creating a spline chart. When people complain that the spline chart is not honest enough, a stepline chart with only horizontal and vertical lines is used. When a line chart is placed against some control or benchmark ranges, we have a control chart. The range is represented by two lines, one on top and one on the bottom, with another optional middle line for the average. And when the product of whatever variables on the x and y axis has some meaning, we have the area chart. It's just like the line chart, but with the area between the line and the x axis is highlighted. When two or more area charts are stacked on top of each other, we have the stacked area chart. When these stacked area chart revolve around a central baseline value, rather than getting stacked on the x-axis, we have the stream graph. 
In these graphs, the outer boundaries of the graph create a symmetrical shape. If you want to make beautiful charts like this one and many others in this video, head over to Datalon, link in the description. When areas overlap, instead of staying on top of each other, we have the density plot or kernel plot. When people separate each area of the density plot into multiple independent charts on top of each other, we have the horizon plot. When a horizon plot just highlights the line instead of the area, we have a ridgeline plot. Having multiple lines on top of each other creates an image of a mountain ridgeline. Moving on to the percentage family. The most famous of them all is the mighty pie chart, which represents portions as slides of the whole circle. Even though it takes so much space for the little value it represents, and there are many other better alternatives, people seem to like it somehow. When people hear about my complaint, they punch a big hole in the middle of the pie and use it for text, labels, legends, etc. The yummy pie becomes a donut chart. When multiple donuts are placed on top of each other with the same center point, we have the multi-level pie chart. When a multi-level pie chart is used to illustrate hierarchical data, it becomes a sunburst chart. People sometimes cut the donut in half to make it healthier, and the chart still works just fine. Some names for this are the semicircle donut, the half moon, the half donut chart, etc. The nightingale chart looks very similar to the pie chart, but it is not. Every slide takes the same percentage, but the radius of each pie represents the value between categories. It's a bar chart that sticks to the circle center. One less confusing variation of the nightingale is the radar chart, where each slide becomes just one point, often connecting with each other. Okay, come back to the percentage family. If you are also not really a pie person, there's the waffle chart for you. It consists of a grid of 100 squares with each representing 1%. If you are not a food person at all, those squares can turn into anything. A sticker, a photo, an icon, a house. It's called the icon array. What if we want to divide the pie or a waffle into irregular pieces to make it more interesting? We have the convex tree map. You can even easily assign a hierarchy structure of the pieces through color coding. A less chaotic version of the convex tree map is the tree map where all pieces are rectangles. When the hierarchy meaning is more important than the percentage value, people use another variation, the circular tree map. Here, all concepts are represented by bubbles inside or adjacent to each other. More about conceptual charts later in this video. When a tree map is placed on the X and Y axes with clear measurements and labels, we have the Meko or Mosaic chart. Here, the heights and widths of all rectangles are very specific and precise. When the Meko chart doesn't fill up one big rectangle, but rather has multiple ones next to each other, we have the Bar Meko chart, or Variable Width Bar chart. This chart doesn't highlight the percentage nature, but rather the comparison of various categories, where you also want to represent the value of two subcomponents. When you have multiple independent data points with two numerical variables and plot each of them as a dot on the x and y axis, you have a scatter plot and a whole new family of variations. When the two axes are placed in the middle, instead of on the left or bottom, we have the quadrant chart or the 2x2 matrix. When the dots on a scatter plot have a sequence nature, we can connect them, and that is the connected scatter plot. When there are so many dots, and the value of each dot is not as important as the overall distribution or pattern of them, we can generalize the density of data points in each area. And when each of those small areas is a hexagon, we have the hexagonal binning. When a scatter plot has one numerical axis and one categorical axis, all the dots in the chart seem to follow a straight line along each category. This is the strip plot. Welcome to Vegas, baby. Sometimes people let all the dots shift around a little bit for aesthetic reasons. We have the jitter plot. Pick just one category group in the jitter plot, we have the bees warm chart. It's like a one dimensional scatter plot with dots closely packed together. However, people sometimes use jitter and bees warm words interchangeably. What if we want to represent data with three numerical variables? We can use the size of each dot as the third dimensional variable. This is called the bubble chart. Another way to visualize three dimensional data in a two dimensional plot is through the contour plot. Every dot on the same line has the same third variable value. This is more popular than you thought. Just open Google Maps and switch to the terrain view. A table is technically a chart, the table chart. When each number in the table is represented on a color scale, the whole table can visually show patterns, trends, and correlations. It becomes the heat map or density table. When a heat map only has one axis to zoom in and focus on the evolution of that variable, we have the one dimensional heat map. 
When a table is formatted in creative ways to represent more dimensions, we have the matrix diagram. Most basic tables are just L-shaped matrices where the labels are on the sides. We also have the T-shaped matrix, the Y-shaped matrix, the X-shaped matrix, the C-shaped matrix, and the roof-shaped matrix. When a heat map is applied to a real map, we have the geographic heat map. A tile map is a real geography map, but with huge pixels, aka tiles. Each tile is equal in size and can come with different colors or texts. A network diagram shows connections between multiple elements. A famous application is the airline's network connection map. A core diagram is like an airline's network connection map, except that all destinations form a circle. An arc diagram is also like an airline's network map, but all airports are placed in a straight line. A Sankey diagram, display flows from one set of values to another. Each flow has a particular height, depending on its quantity. A famous example is the traffic flow in Google Analytics. A more complicated version of the Sankey diagram is the alluvial chart, where there are more than two stages where the data set flows through. A flow chart is a diagram that depicts subsequent steps in a process. A Venn diagram has overlapping circles or other shapes to illustrate the hypothetical and logical relationships between two or more sets of items. An Euler diagram is just a Venn diagram, but it shows the actual intersection combinations in the real world, while the Venn diagram shows hypothetically possible relations. A word cloud is not necessarily a chart, but it's a catchy illustration of concepts with size representing frequency or popularity. A small multiple plot, or trellis chart, is a series of similar graphs or charts using the same scale and axes, placed nicely on a grid together to compare and highlight trends and patterns. A funnel or pyramid chart is used to visualize the quantitative flow of a concept through different stages of a process. Finally, the sacred and most popular chart in consulting is the dendrogram chart, which represents concepts and their relationships using tree branches. When a dendrogram chart is used to draw an organization structure, we have the hierarchy diagram. When a dendrogram chart is used in the computer science world, where every decision has two alternatives, we have a binary decision diagram. The ternary plot, some other names are triangle plot, simplex plot, and Gibbs triangle, is something so different from every chart above. Whenever you have three variables that always sum to a constant, then this is the perfect graph. Alright, now head over to this video to see every business frameworks explained.